All right, we are delighted to bring back once again a cornerstone. It's actually Raj has been coming here before I was even the pastor of the church. So you precede me. You know, and so uh, we're just so excited. What he doing? He does, by the way. He's from India, came to the United States, and and he went back to India, and now he's preaching and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The 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 um, second, I believe, it's the most populous country in the world is India. It will it will succeed China because they keep having more and more children. And the middle class is rising. God is doing something in the East. And these Hindus and, and Muslims need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot of our emphasis of our church is primarily directed at the unreached people groups in the Muslim nations of the world, in the Hindu nations of the world, because they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're absolutely delighted that you and I get to go around the world together with Rajan through our prayers through our giving, and so would you please welcome back to Cornerstone, Rajan, and let me give you a microphone, Rajan, and his beautiful family, which I'm going to ask, and they're all here now, if his whole family, which is like half the church, could just stand right now, Where, where's this family at, where's this, recognize this family, we got some over there, there's, there's like, Josh is in the back, look at that, look at that, you know, it's amazing, I don't know anybody else that travels with his entire family. They're all in the ministry. It's a family ministry. Isn't that cool? A family ministry. And they're just delightful kids and adults now. And so we're just so happy they're here today. So God bless you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Pastor. It's a real privilege and an honor to be here. And I greet each one of you in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. Hallelujah. Uh, I was just thinking in my mind, I think the first time I had an opportunity to minister in this church was in 1995. And uh, so it's all these years, you as a body have had a part every month in the nation of India. So I want to tell you, thank you so much. And thank you, Pastor, for your love. And I'm so grateful to God for the friendship and the relationship and the partnership, uh, partnering together for the harvest of souls. Uh, we have the privilege of <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's all right. Um, we are involved in three specific areas. We use the media every day, daily television program, half an hour, very word intensive, helping my people to come to know Jesus Christ and knowing the word of God. It's called Victory Today. Reason being, 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid the full price. The price has been paid today. We, by faith, have to appropriate the victory that God has already provided. The second thing we do is we are involved in training and raising up believers in my nation. As Pastor said, we live in a nation with 1.2 billion people. Unless every believer in, G in India is raised up, that is, they have an encounter with a living God, recognize who they are in Christ, and begin to share the good news and demonstrate the power of God, we can never reach my nation. So we travel extensively the northern portion of our nation, training people. This time we had an opportunity to even go into Nepal. This is the countryside of Nepal. And we had a young man we trained from here two years ago, and because of him, uh, this conference took place. These are some pastors in that area. But he was able to go into the villages of Nepal and minister to people and began to see God do some great things. So he contacted us and asked us if we would be willing to train. I think it started like about 50, then it became 100. Uh, these are over 100 people who rode on a bicycle 30 kilometers just to come to this conference. This building is the only place upstairs where there was a big uh, hall that we could rent. It will seat about 300 people. Uh, it did have air conditioning, but it was just real hot because more people came in. But it was not just 300. The day we started the conference, we had 625 men and women. And we even sent buses up to 100 kilometers to bring people in. But the most important thing is the hunger in the heart of these people, the Nepali believers, for Jesus to know the word, to, to receive the anointing of God in their lives, and to do the work that God has for them. Look at the f young people here. Over 50% of the people who came are 25 years and 
and uh, younger because I believe God is raising a new generation. When we do such events, uh, this, uh, you know, we provide for them food and place to stay house for 625 people. And the per reason is a lot of them cannot afford to come. They give up their daily work to be there. So this is just a small thing that we get to do in their lives. This is an actual church. A lot of churches are like this, just an inch thick wall, bamboo uh, rods are used, uh, plastered with cow dung and, uh, and mud with a single bulb there, but they are able to have churches. And the people come, it's crammed, it's full. We have people inside, we have people outside. Again, they are there because they want to hear the word of God. They want God to touch their lives. And so something exciting is happening in Nepal. A new generation is being raised up to change the spiritual landscape of Nepal. For many years, the believers were persecuted, locked up, all kinds of negative things happen. But today, it's a new day. And, e and in my nation, same thing. A lot of young people are pressing into Christ, wanting Jesus Christ to touch them and change them. And, and God is doing something very special. And we need you to remember India. We need you to pray for India. Pray for the work. Pray that the door will be open. We have an interesting circumstance in India. Yes, our constitution guarantees religious freedom, but uh, we have a particular uh, government in place that is not quite friendly to us. But, however, God is still keeping the door wide open. And the door is open, especially in the area of media. We are able to buy Tom air programs every day. Why would we use television? 70% of my nation lives in villages, and that's over 800 million people. And depending on the state, in some places, 50% or more cannot read and write. You cannot give them a tract. You cannot give them a portion of the Bible. But through television, we are able to go directly into the homes. It's interesting. If you go through the village areas of India, perhaps they do not have furniture, an uh, indoor kitchen, or an uh, indoor toilet, running water. But every home, every one-room dwelling place has television. And, and uh, only God could have thought that out for India. You know, here it may be a luxury, wonderful, common thing. Every room has a TV. But to have a TV in India in every hut is a miracle. And it's a good one because we can buy time and air program where people sitting in their huts can hear the word of God. This young man, see, in all of this, you as a church have had a part. Ten years ago, he came to our to a school of ministry, short-term training program. He had an education degree. He really did not have much focus in life. But in the eight weeks he was with us, God touched him and changed him. And we would take people from the south with us into the northern part of our nation as we are training our brothers and sisters in the north. So when he went to the north, God began to speak to him, give him a great desire to minister in the north. I come from a state where we do not like to speak the North Indian language for political purposes, but he has learned it. And uh, today, because of his life, there are five churches in the state of Punjab. He's in, in near the, near the uh, Pakistani border area, and he has birthed five children. That's his graduation uh, from our short-term training school 10 years ago. So when you look at this picture, these are wonderful men of God. God is raising in the state of Punjab. But beyond, behind them, you see the massive harvest field. These, this is paddy, rice fields ready for harvest. I want you to always remember this picture when you think of India. 1.2 billion people created by God. Not one of them are in this world by accident. Before The Bible says before the foundation of the earth, God has chosen us. These people are living right now. This is our generation. And we have a God-given mandate to reach this generation with the love of God, with the word of God and the power of God. And uh, in India, amidst all these various religions and numerous types of uh, things people identify as a God, you do not find one that says, I love you. There's not one who says, I will forgive you. So the good news, it's called good news because for the first time, People are hearing about Jesus Christ. He loves us just the way we are. And he draws us to him by his love. He changes our lives. His power is incredible. Nothing can stop it. It transforms us. Here's one more exciting thing about India. 
all these generations, India is a very ancient country. You hear India mentioned in the book of Esther. So you go back a long time. But because of television, this is the first generation of people in my nation who will hear the gospel. The entire nation. Before pockets, different places, the gospel was preached. But now, because of media, we can reach our whole generation. This will be the first generation of uh, men and women in my nation who will know who Christ is, the price he has paid, and the opportunity they have to receive this free gift and walk in a beautiful covenant relationship with God where their lives are totally and completely changed. You know, I want to share a quick testimony. In the early 1900s, a lady came from Ireland. And uh, she came, she never married. Uh, she came from a wealthy home that brought her to India. Uh, she was the only one in our home who had dark eyes and dark hair. And uh, she came to India, was involved in rescuing girls from temples where they were left there by their families because we have certain social evils like dowry and stuff like that, and people couldn't afford it. So they left their girls in the temple, say, I dedicate my child to God. But there were a lot of bad things that happened to them. They were taken advantage of, but this lady was involved by, through the power of the Holy Spirit to rescue several of them. And one day, she was in a neighboring town, and she saw some children playing in the street. And uh, she went up to them and began to share with them about Christ. And a little girl, 11 years old, received Jesus Christ. She went home. Her parents were staunch Hindus. And uh, they could not believe such a bad thing could have happened in their home. This uh, little girl receiving Christ had brought some shame and stain to their family. And so they, they disciplined her, denied her food, even locked her up. And finally one day they gave her a choice. Either worship all these uh, various figures in our home or you will have to leave our home. And they literally put her out. She left the home and went to the lady who, who shared Christ with her in the neighboring village. And that lady raised her up, got her married to a Christian man. And this young girl became my grandmother. So three generations ago, because of a person who was sent, many lives were touched, including this 11-year-old. And see what God has done. Three generations later, Miss Amy Carmichael would have never seen with her eyes or dreamed how India could be reached. But I am one among many God is using to reach my nation. And uh, so every seed is important. Your seed is important. So I want to encourage you to please consider underwriting program, airtime cost in India. It's like taking food to people. Your seed is very important. And your seed will result in men and women giving their lives to Christ, people receiving incredible miracles in their life, and you can make it possible. Every 30-minute airtime cost, not, not the production, just the airtime is $100. So ask God what you should do, one, two, three, a whole week. Whatever God speaks to you, do it with purpose so that souls will be saved. Amen? This morning, I want to speak to you about demonstrating the power of God. The God we serve is an unlimited God. I want you to say that after me. The God whom I serve. Oh, come on. I want some living people speaking. You all had some coffee out there, right? Maybe we should take you all to the church in Nepal where you get to sit on the floor. <laughs> Listen. The God whom I serve, God whom I serve. is an unlimited God. He's unlimited in power, unlimited in ability, unlimited in wisdom, and he's my heavenly father. And our God, no, now I'm going to speak. <laughs> but our God has not left us orphaned or abandoned us. He is, he is, he's continually Equipping us with his love. Brother, don't take the volume down. With his love, with his power, with his strength, and his divine presence. So that in every circumstance, you and I 
can have victory over the devil and walk in the victory that Jesus has already paid the price. The price has already been paid. Not, he, he did not have a thanksgiving discount price. He had to pay a hundred percent price for every sin in our lives to be forgiven. He paid the full price for the curse to be destroyed. He paid the full price for the sickness in your body even now to be healed 2,000 years ago. And the desire of God is that we will recognize this unlimited incredible power that he has placed inside us as believers and we will activate it and use it to deal with our struggles, to face the impossibility and to appropriate the fulfillment of the promises that you and I have in the Bible. God's word is true. Jesus said, my words are life. And spirit, his life, his spirit is in his word. And the Bible also says that God is faithful to the words that he has spoken. So it is so important that we demonstrate the power of God. In order to demonstrate the power of God, we should know or have a clear understanding of the will and purpose of why Jesus came into this world. I want to read some scriptures to you. In, in, the, in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord does not delay or is not tardy or slow about what he promises, according to some people's conception of slowness. But he is long-suffering extraordinarily patient towards you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. So it is God's desire in his heart that the people, men and women, that he has created generation after generation will not go into eternal destruction, but will receive his offer of forgiveness and their lives be transformed, that they can have a fruit-producing relationship with Jesus Christ. And he sent Christ to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Look at the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came and found each one of us where we were. Perhaps we were not in a place where anybody knew spiritually where we were, but he knew, and his love reached into that area. He used somebody to touch you. So through his word, you and I have been marvelously transformed. Romans 5.15 says, But the free gift is not like the offense, but if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, that the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many. One man, Adam, sinned, and we were all plunged into that bondage. But through one man, his obedience, we are all born again, delivered, set free. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Today, you and I are alive through Jesus Christ. We have a new life. We are delivered from sin. We are delivered from bondage. There is freedom. There is victory. And as we seek God, pursue God, allow his word to firmly grab control of our heart and mind, we will continue to walk in victory. And that's why Jesus came. The Bible also says in, 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 in the book of John, 3 John, um, uh, the first John chapter one, verse eight, the Bible says, even for this reason was the son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Every wicked work 
that the devil has ever per perpetuated in the lives of people, whether in our minds, in our hearts, in our emotions, in our physical body, in our finances, in our marriages, in our families, wherever it is, whatever it is. For even for that reason was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy. That's what Jesus accomplished on the cross. There was total destruction of every wicked work of the enemy. Now, the will of God. God has a will. It's a tremendous will. To understand the will of God, let's look at will as understood in natural terms. Say if there is a wealthy person, he makes out a will. And the will is a legal, official document that he executes during his lifetime to determine the legacy he's going to leave behind. Now, that person can alter that will, change the will, any number of times he chooses. But the day that person dies, that will is sealed, is established. So the death of the will maker seals the will. Similarly, God has a wonderful will. He has never changed that will. And he sent his son Jesus into this world to fulfill his will. And the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has sealed the will of God permanently. The blood of Jesus has, has ratified and attested and sealed this will it can never be changed. Nobody can change it. No human entity can change it. God cannot change it. And the will of God is available to us as you and I read his word and we discover what God has provided for us. Listen how Jesus explains the will. He says in John chapter 4 verse 34, Jesus said to the disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish and completely finish his work. His food, his nourishment was to do the will of God, to bring pleasure to God, his father who sent him, and to accomplish and completely finish his work. And that's what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. So the will of God, the sum total purpose of Jesus Christ coming into this world, experiencing all that he experienced and everything he accomplished, especially the incredible price he paid by laying down his life for you and me, is to fulfill the will of God and leave for us a complete destruction of the wicked works of the devil. That's why the Bible says, 1 John 3, 8, again, for this purpose, for this purpose, if you look at your life and you see areas where the enemy has established a stronghold, where there's an area of weakness, a particular sin that we are falling into again and again, whatever that area is, a sickness, a challenge in your finances, a particular generational curse, whatever it is that you already know, God says, that has already been dealt with. 1 John 3, 8, for that reason, for that area that you're dealing with, you are confronted with in your life, even for that reason was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of of the devil. I want all of us to say the scripture. Let's repeat it after me. For this reason was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Your victory was purchased 2,000 years ago. I want you to raise your right hand. Repeat this after me. Jesus Destroyed the works of the devil. Therefore, Satan has no authority over my life. Hallelujah. The God we serve is an unlimited God. A man came to Jesus. He was a Roman officer. 
He's, he's referred to as a centurion. He had 100 people under his command. And he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, my servant is grievously sick. He's paralyzed. He's in a lot of pain. Will you come and heal him? And without any hesitation, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. He didn't hesitate because it was God's will for people to experience healing in their body. Sickness came into this world as a result of sin. Adam and Eve's disobedience opened the floodgate of sin. And one of the consequences was sickness. And it, the ultimate consequence is death. But for sickness, God is providing forgiveness for each one of us. For I'm sorry, for sin, God has provided forgiveness. And for sickness, he is providing divine healing. And for death, he has provided eternal life. And we are a blessed people. And God's will has not changed. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And there was something more here. The centurion, even though he was a Roman, he saw something that nobody else saw at the time. He saw Jesus just the way he was. If you remember his words, he said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come to my home, but stand right here and speak the word and my servant will be healed. Now, what did he mean by that? This centurion was a high-ranking Roman officer. His commission was given to him by Caesar. So he's a man under authority. But he's also a man of authority because he has 100 soldiers under his command. He continues. He said, Lord, if I tell one of my soldiers to go, he obeys me immediately. He goes. I tell another to come. He comes immediately. What do you mean by that? He says, my words are backed by the entire might of the Roman army and Caesar. That's why a man, a soldier, when I tell him something, doesn't talk back, doesn't hesitate, doesn't disobey. He immediately obeys me. And that's why he looks at Jesus and says, Lord, just stand here and speak the word. Why, what did he mean by that? He's in his mind, he's recognizing that standing before him is the son of the living God in flesh and blood. The creator of heaven and earth has delegated his power and authority to Jesus Christ. And he is God's representative on this earth. And if he spoke, it's like God speaking and that word has to be obeyed. Just like he's a man under authority, he looks at Jesus and realizes Jesus is under the authority of God. But he has also been given authority. And if he spoke just like he commands his soldiers, it will be obeyed. Except his authority and power is greater. It didn't come from Caesar or some human entity. It came from God himself. And he said, speak the word and my servant will be healed. And the story goes on how the man immediately received that, that centurion, and went back and discovered that at that very moment, his servant, who was paralyzed in bed, was completely healed. And Jesus said, he has never seen such great faith. It's time that we see Jesus just the way he is, as revealed to us in his word. Not through our experience, not through just our rational mind, not through how somebody has said he is. But it is time that you and I see Jesus the way the centurion saw. He realized that Jesus is unlimited. He need not come into his house. He need not lay his hands on his sick servant. But he could stand right there and speak the word. And the servant will be healed. Before you and I 
can demonstrate the power of God. Our faith that God has given us must be tied to a known factor. We need to know that when we come to God, that he hears us. That when we come to God, we must come in faith and never waver. Look at what the book, Bible says, book of James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he who wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. The Amplified Bible says, let not such a man even imagine he will receive something from the Lord. So we need to know how to pray in faith, believing. Faith. Many people are, are affected by, by what the enemy tells them. Sometimes maybe the enemy tells people, you just do not have enough faith. Or, or you, your faith is not great like that of the centurion. Faith is not something a human being can give another person. Neither is faith something that you and I can manufacture or work ourselves up. Faith is a gift from God. The day you and I gave our lives to Jesus Christ, Almighty God has placed inside us, deposited inside us, a measure of faith. Inside you, there's already faith. That faith is infallible, means there is no room for error in that faith because it came from God. It's not a product from earth. It came from heaven, from God, directly placed inside us. And our faith cannot be penetrated, tampered by the devil either. Inside you today is the faith you need for the victory that you are trusting Jesus for. You already have it. Remember Peter? He was walking on the water. Great manifestation of faith. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he was looking at how high the wave was or how intense the wind was. He began to sink. And Jesus actually rebuked him and said, Oh, you of little faith. But even if he had little faith, Jesus still worked with him. So he will work with faith. Faith is faith. It doesn't matter what size it is. You have the faith. Listen to what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. And whatever you ask for in prayer, having faith and really believing, you will receive. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Faith is already in us today for the miracle that we need. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we can see Jesus as he is. He is not limited by anything in this world. You and I may be limited, but he's unlimited. And he's able to touch us, heal our bodies, transform our minds. Even this morning, none of us have to leave this pre his presence today the same way we came. We don't have to still hold on to our weakness. We need not hold on to our addiction. We need not be bound by the same sin. We need not live under the same bondage. You and I must be free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. This is the day. This is the hour. The centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant knew it was unnecessary for Jesus to come to his house because he knew it's God's will to heal him. And there was only one thing he needed to make it happen, and that is to know that, the, that this Jesus is unlimited. When God sent his son into this world, he sent him, we all know, with a physical body like you and I have. The seed was from God, but he had a human body just like you and I have. And in every confrontation with the devil, every time he heals 
a sick person or cast out demons or raise the dead. He is in direct conflict with the devil. And he did not accomplish those miracles with his natural strength. The Bible clearly says God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost. And he went about doing good, healing everyone who was oppressed by the devil. And today, God has entrusted a divine mandate in our hand to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In your home, to your family, among your relatives, among your neighbors, people you do business with, wherever we go, we are always under that divine mandate. And God will continuously open doors for you and I to share the good news and to demonstrate his power. Just like Jesus was equipped with by power and anointing from God, you and I have been an equipped and anointed by Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. As the Father sent him. You and I have the same anointing that was in the life of Jesus. There are not various degrees of anointing. There's only one anointing. It, it doesn't matter how defeated you feel today in your heart. It doesn't matter all that has happened in your life. Today is a new day. It's time to look at Jesus. It's time to allow him to have total control of your heart and mind. It's time to make a full surrender of our life to Jesus, not hold anything back. It's time to allow him to be our Lord. And today, he will equip you, anoint you. He will give you the same anointing that was on his life. The same manifestation of faith Jesus had is available for you and me. The same power that Jesus operated under is available for each one of us. So that we too can have victory over the enemy. So that you and I can have victory in every circumstance in our lives. Remember the disciples? When Jesus was arrested, crucified, they all left him. They abandoned. They were filled with so much fear. Even when the first report came, when those two ladies came and told them, hey, the tomb is empty, they still could not believe. Yet something happened. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And their lives are so totally and radically changed. They had a fresh anointing on their lives, a new boldness in their lives. The very men who even denied they knew Jesus are openly standing and preaching and sharing the good news. When Peter and John went towards the temple to pray, they encountered a man who was crippled from birth. That's the first miracle that took place after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter looks at the man and who, who, who and says, such as I have, give I unto you. I don't have silver. I don't have gold. But I have something that will radically change you. It will restore your health. And he, and he demonstrated the power of God. The man was healed. He jumped up. He ran, praising God. Next thing you know, a huge crowd gathered because they have not seen this miracle. They knew that man. He's begging, that all, begging in that place all his life. They demonstrated the power of God. People who are fearful, who ran away, they demonstrated the power of God. And thousands were added to the body of Christ that day. Today, there may be fear in your life. Maybe there's condemnation. Maybe the enemy is constantly accusing you. But Jesus is here to deliver you. If we will give our hearts to Christ and not hold anything back. He says, now there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We were never to live with condemnation in our lives. We are to go to him and be cleansed. 
We are to go to him and see destruction of strongholds in our mind. Hesitation, fear is not part of our living. The God we serve is not a fearful God. He gives us boldness. He gives us the power to confront every demonic spirit that will try to come and oppress us. We can be free today. But most importantly, God's desire is that we demonstrate his power through our lives. In a different place in the book of Acts, it says that when they demonstrated the power of God, entire cities were coming to Christ and people said, here comes the men or people who turned the world upside down. They turned cities upside down. Homes were turned upside down. Nations were turned upside down. How? Through the demonstration of the power of God. Every one of us is the right candidate. Don't look to yourself. God is not dependent on what we have to offer him. What God is dependent upon is how his power will change each one of us and make us the instrument we should be. He took a man like Gideon, fearful, hiding in the hills, who had no desire to confront the enemy, the Midianites, and no one even knew where he was, yet God knew where he was. He came to him. He declared, he said, mighty man of fearless courage, the Lord is with you. And Gideon did not see himself that way. He never saw himself as a mighty man of fearless courage. He saw himself as someone who needs to avoid the conflict, run somewhere, hide. But where he was hiding, he encountered God. If God can take a man like him, hiding, a failure, avoiding everything, recluse, and what is he showing us? Gideon had nothing to offer him. Gideon was not a leader. He was not a general. He had never commanded an army. Yet how was this man chosen? Because God chose him and equipped him. And he was able to bring people together. God just gives him 300 men. And he confronts an army that was filled with tens and thousands. And they had a decisive victory. You are precious in His sight. You are marked by God. The Bible says even before the foundation of the earth, before the act of creation, God has already chosen you, selected you, elected you. That's you. And His plan cannot be stopped. His plan is to touch you, transform you through His power, Open up the eyes of our understanding so that we can know what God has provided and his plan for our lives and live in this world fulfilling his plan. Victorious every step of the way. That's God's plan for you. Stand together. Let's pray together for a moment. Everybody raise your right hand. Pray after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you. You are my living God. Touch my life, oh God. I receive your word. I offer myself to you as a living sacrifice. Invade my life. Possess me. Take control of my mind, my heart, my emotions. Every day, I want to live for you. Equip me with your faith. Equip me with your anointing. Equip me with your power so that I can be an effective vessel in your hand. Through my life, men and women will be born again. Through your power operating in my life, people will be healed. The sick will be healed. The lepers cleansed. The dead raised. Because freely I have received. 
and freely I give. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, take a moment, talk to him. Talk to him. Very important moment. Talk to him. At the end of the service, after pastor's done, my children and I will stand in the front here. And you need a miracle. Come. We'll love to pray with you. Because God has already paid the price for your full victory. Amen. Thank you so much, Roger. Really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing today. Bless you. Let me see just for a moment. Just for a moment. I just wanted to just close out the service here in a few moments. We're going to, again, we're going to, a dismissive service, but we're going to open the front for prayer, and uh, it's just a blessing to have his entire family in the ministry. It's such a neat thing. Hey, listen, I want to do a couple of things, and I just wanted to uh, prepare to, to, to give to Raja and his family. This, this offering is completely for him. There's no pressure intended at all. You can give, you ha you can give if you want to, excuse me. You don't have to. You get to. And uh, we, all this will go completely for them and what they're doing. We're so excited about that. But before we do that, I also wanted to ask you, I want to pray for you one more time. I know we have a lot of prayer today, but I just want to ask you a question. How are you doing with Jesus? Heard a lot today, didn't we? You know, Jesus loves you. He desires to know you. He desires for you to be surrendered to him because he's got a good plan for your life. If you just bow your heads, I'm just going to pray for you right now. If you want to pray in your own heart, this prayer is just a, it's a way to begin and perhaps to recommit. You pray quietly in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. You paid for the price that I could not pay. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I hand over my life today to you. I declare that you are my God and I'm not God. You are. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I believe you are the Son of God. And I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed. I say, Pastor, just so I know how to better pray for you and instruct you this morning. I say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer this morning for the first time. I'm going back my life back to Christ. Anyone just, yes. Anyone else? I say, Pastor. Is anyone else? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You look it up if you could, please. So, as you see right here, this is my decision today. I'm committing my life to Christ. I'm renewing my commitment to Christ. If you could just fill that out. And sign it. And we're going to ask the ushers as they collect the offering today. If you want to drop your card in here, if you need prayer for anything, we want to be able to pray with you. Okay, everybody? Ushers, let's go ahead and do that. And I just wanted to, I know a lot of prayer today, but I think prayer is good. Uh, Father, I just pray you bless Raj and his family. We thank you for what you're doing in their lives. We ask you to uh, just exceed their expectations, Father. And we thank you to show yourself powerful. Thank you for their boldness to step out into a hostile area and to take. And to give it all to you, we ask you to bless them in Jesus' name. Go ahead. Thank you. And what we're also going to do, oh, by the way, as we end the service, uh, we have a front. We're going to open the front for uh, prayer. We have growth track on the right-hand side. We'll start right after the service. Uh, it's connection. Love to have you come to that, okay? Let's all stand if we could. I'm going to ask Roger and his family to make yourself forward. If you want prayers, come make yourself up forward if you want to do that. As we sing this last closing song in the open front.
so much for today that we can experience your love and grace, Lord. We ask you bless everyone as we officially dismiss. We thank you for what's taking place up front as we continue to pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thanks for coming. The, the, the front is open for prayer. Love to have you come to Grove Track on your right-hand side. God bless you guys. Thank you.